so Chris has joined us today to really talk about um, kind of the, the end of lockdown. So a lot of stuff is happening now whereby people are starting to talk about it. We're trying to be released in terms of what we can do. You know, the future of sports, for professional sports, we can see that, you know, things are coming a little bit back to normal, you know, with the Bundesliga returning, hopefully the Premiership, you know. So we've got Chris on today to really talk about from a physio point of view of, of what's going on. Um, and we're going to touch on lots of global areas for different sports and then try and do some specific work in those areas for sports. So start off, Chris, thanks for joining us. I know you've been probably busy doing your, your press ups in your, in your full kits today. Um, <laughs> but let, let's, let's start with this idea of reconditioning. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll take a prime example. You know, I play a team sport. I haven't been able to play that sport for probably coming up close to three, three and a half months now. I have been doing a little bit of work, but not to the level that I was. You know, what, what's the first couple of things that we really need to think about from a, we'll took, look at it at two points. One from an injury point of view, uh, and then we'll talk about the performance point of view. I think this is something which no one's really ever experienced before. And, and some people are, are comparing it to like a, a prolonged off season, but I think even that's incorrect because in the off season, players, you know, players these days, they train throughout the off season. They have access to gyms, they have access to weights. And uh, this is, this is completely different. Um, the, the access to weights from what I've seen across the world has been very, very different for players, rugby players you know, that I'm involved with. You know, some have got 120, 130 kgs in their back garden and they're able to maintain a certain degree of uh, hypertrophy, strength and power training, whereas some have had a few bands and they're stuck in a top floor flat. So it's completely different. So we really need to to look at this on a case by case basis for each player as an individual. Um, and, you know, depending on how the lockdown has worked in that player's country, um, we're going to have to take people right back to, back to basics. And, you know, uh, two players uh, are going to be completely different due to, you know, what they've done, their access to, to coaching and to, to equipment. So we need to take it right back and, and start thinking about, you know, developing a plan starting from the, from the lowest level. Don't, don't kind of overestimate, over congratulate, congratulate yourself in what you've done. Uh, uh, that sounds a bit harsh, but uh, even if you've been able to do a bit of jumping, a bit of running and, and some weights, that's, that's way off, you know, a competitive two, you know, two hours training a day or uh, a 90 minute match with max accelerations and change of direction. So we have to try and find uh, a starting point um, for, for each individual. So we need to find a starting level, self-analyze what you've done over the past six to eight weeks, look at what your sport requires. And then we have to try and come in at an entry point there, which should involve some access to some heavy resistance equipment because we need to start with that and try and get um, uh, some hypertrophy and strength back um, depending on what you've had access to um, during this period of time. What you've touched on there is that you know similar to how we would work with an athlete you know a new athlete for example rocks up day one as a physio you, you have a global assessment of them as a strength and conditioning coach, we have a global assessment of them. We kind of put them two together and then we have a bit more of a plan going on so that everyone out there needs to get that, that plan. Mm. Now, wh when we're looking at that, what advice to you or what advice would you give, especially from a team sport? You know, you touched on some, some max acceleration work, you know, because obviously what's happened is that as much as we'd like to think, as you touched on there, that our training at home or running in the fields or, or training on the pitches on our own is, is just ticking us over. 
what kind of things do we need to look for? Definitely areas that are more prone to injury if we haven't been using them. A lot of the training which I've seen people doing at home uh, has been probably what we consider, and this is this is tendons is one of the key things that we've got to think about and, and risk of tendon injury um, on return to sport. So a lot of the work that we've been doing, I've seen people doing, has been slower or low tendon uh, load work. So that might be body weight exercises, that might be just press ups, body weight squats and lunges. And even if they've got a little bit of weight, um, it's been quite slow work, which is, is good for maintaining um, some degree of muscle tendon capacity, but is completely uh, the, the tendons and, and tendon stiffness that we we need for our sports tendons are springs and they um, they store and they release energy and we get that from um, jumping hopping max sprinting and change of direction so we haven't been we haven't really been given the tendons that type of stimulus and that's the that's the type of force that they will experience when they get back to um, competitive uh, team sports so we need to bridge the gap between those two okay because um everyone's talking about this this isn't new information but people keep going back to the um the nfl lockdown of 2011 and i think they were i think it was 10, 10 actually i think it was 20 weeks where there was a lockdown and on return to that there was uh, a massive increase in Achilles tendon ruptures in the first couple of months and then a lot of soft tissue injuries over that period of time. So we need to make sure we bridge that gap and um, people that uh, people that haven't got any um, tendon issues, they're fit and they're healthy and they're just working on general injury prevention, we need to make sure that as soon as possible we can get um, starting them off on a program where we can include um, plyometrics, double leg, single leg, and change of direction work, and uh, multi-directional running work. Again, I've seen a lot of straight line running work during lockdown. A lot of people been going on long, slow distance runs, um, which is which is fantastic. Good for body composition. Good for you know mental health. But it's not specific to the sport. And it's not to protect them to protect them from the injuries that we commonly see, like Achilles tendon problems uh, and, and worst case scenario, Achilles tendon ruptures that happen with rapid accelerations, decelerations and, and change of direction. So we need to start incorporating that into people's programs. You know, that's a great point. And just so we can put a little bit more meat on the bone. In terms of time frames, so let's say, for example, the government's come out and say, right, we can start football training, amateur football training, rugby football training, you know, I don't know, 1st of July, mid of July. How many weeks in advance would you advise us to start really thinking about and prepping for that? Is it a week of training, two, three, four weeks from a tendon um, adaptation point of view? In a perfect world, from a tendon point of view, you're looking at three months, but we're not going to get that. We're not going to get that. And we don't get that uh, in, in general kind of uh, uh, off-season, pre-season periods. Um, but we need to be looking at at least six weeks. Okay, six weeks of normal access to full uh, strength and conditioning equipment and strength and conditioning programs in that team setting, even if it's in small numbers, you know, social distancing, physical distancing groups of, you know, under five people. Uh, and we need that, you know, six weeks of progressive uh, field-based training load, you know, and that needs to be, uh, I think that needs to be protected. Um, I think lockdown has been a bit different, you know, in different places. Uh, around the world um, so 
yeah, some people have been able to go out and hit fields and do change of direction, max accelerations, de accelerations, but some some people haven't. And that's that's what I've been reading about in professional football. You know, some some players have had uh, you know, have got pitches in their back garden, and some players uh, live in penthouse apartments and they're in lockdown up there in the middle of cities. Now those two same players coming back, you know. It, it, we, it's a team-based sport, but it's a team base of ind individuals, and they've got completely different scenarios. So I think you're all you're going to have to go for a blanket at least six weeks um, to get this um, this tendon, uh, these tendon properties, this tendon stiffness, and uh, you know to get this uh, muscular and tendon capacity back. I'd, I'd say that would be a safe minimum. I, I I think four weeks is um, we're just we're compromising players' uh, health and welfare um, for for getting leagues and uh, sport up and running. We need to get a balance between the two, and I think that's uh, yeah, it's a real difficult thing. It's a real uh, trade off between you know what what sport and society wants and, and fans want versus um, what players need from a health and welfare point of view. Yeah, and I think to add from a strength and conditioning point of view, it's a little bit no different to off-season, whereby you know, we would send out an off-season programme to a player. They'd come back day one and we'd say, well, what have you done? And they'd be like, yep, I've, I've done the full programme, whatever. And then within you know, a week, we'd know who'd actually done some work and who hadn't. Mm. So from that point of view, as an amateur player, you have to be honest with your coaches. And when they say, what have you done? You have to tell them straight, you know, I've, I've done nothing or I've done this or I've done quite a bit, to be fair. So that, you know, coaches can um, progress and regress sessions depending on what's been going on. And I think that's hugely important and you've touched on that. But before we started talking, um, you kind of mentioned that you, you've been sat on a couple of medical boards for, for what's been going on. You know, what, what do you see as kind of the future from, a, obviously, you've been on a rugby board. What do you see as the future of international rugby? You know, they've obviously cancelled the, the summer tours. Um, I think they're hoping to try and get the November test series back on board from from a financial point of view, from a, a mental health point of view for both the players and the fans. But it'd be good to hear, you know, what you what you can tell us, what you can't tell us, don't tell us. I mean, luckily, there's, on, on the, there's lots of information available at the moment for everyone and uh, World Rugby have set out a strategy and you can find that on their, their um, player welfare section and, and they've put out draft guidelines for the Pro 14 and they've put their... Uh, World Rugby um, working document available to everyone so that, you know, uh, not just rugby, but all sports can see what their plans and, and ideas are. And yeah, there's just looking and, and, and just, you know, from that view and from that planning, there's just, it's a shame about the summer tours. Uh, Russia's lost out there as well. Uh, so there's a few matches that, free matches that have been cancelled there for us. And, and it's the same for all other countries. There just isn't enough time to, a system has to be built um, and sport will look very different initially. Uh, and it's much easier to, um, the length of time it's gonna to take to reintegrate uh, just small domestic training and small domestic competitions, you know, like within England, um, it's gonna take time. Uh, the 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 amount of uh, the changes of systems being put being put into place are, are huge, and there's talk initially of you know small small group training. So you might have you know you've got these big uh, rugby gyms that you know cater for you know good numbers of players. You know maybe 10, 15, 20 people at a time, but we've got to be looking at under five or maybe under ten. Um, in this area, any one time with the full, uh, you know, hygiene and cleaning beforehand, and the, uh, some degree of personal protective equipment, whether it may be um, masks or 
or masks and gloves plus cleaning of the environment each time uh, a player's used it we're going to see um things are going to take longer um you know for, i think for if it's done well i think um the days are going to look quite quite long uh for some of the staff members there because <laughs> they're going to have to run multiple strength and conditioning sessions uh you know uh and same for the for the coaches as well there's going to be you know smaller groups we need to uh, to minimize that that distance in and and, and it's gonna you know take some time to reintegrate um full team sessions and that will depend on governments as well and government guidelines on you know uh mass gatherings you know when can we have 10 20 30 40 50 people you know if you've got squads 50 60 people how long before they can be in a close environment or train together on a pitch in a gym so um it's going to take a while to integrate that in just just in local club environments and and therefore you know the knock-on effects of that are going to be um uh, a system of trying to create a system where we can have games um and and there's talk of um having these behind as, as we see as we've seen in the the german league you know behind closed door games and there's a talk of numbers you know it can be about 160 170 people required to play a behind closed doors uh rugby game um players sports staff TV, media, medical coverage, security. We've touched a little bit on tendon rehab, but what do you think in terms from a, a return to contact scenario? What, what can guys be doing specifically now to aid their return to contact? And then once we get back to a little bit of, you know, however we're going to work it. The first thing, and I, I, I forgot to mention in the last point how, how things will look different as well, is that somehow we need to monitor, and it will happen, we will be monitoring players each day for actually uh, potential symptoms of COVID-19. So the guidelines at this moment is a self, every morning before you go to training in your team environment is a self-screen where you self-screen for symptoms of COVID-19 and if possible, you take your temperature and that gets submitted maybe like by a, a via a Google form or something like that. And the coaches and uh, staff will see this and decide who comes in and who doesn't come in to train that day. And, and that's important, especially when it comes to contact training. So we need to make sure that and that's it's a bit of a this is a every day. You know, if you go and shop and you come to contact with people. And then you're going back to train your teams. We need to be on on top of this just to make sure you know we keep that spread down, which which happens in that contact environment. So that's that's one thing to make sure you know that we're getting back into this uh, contact rugby, but we're still doing the right things and we're minimising the chances of this spread in a in a team environment. Um, preparing for contact, uh, as we talked before about lower limb. Same for upper limb as well, and probably more importantly for upper limb, we we've seen a lot of maybe banded work and and work that is you know is is quite low uh, quite low load and quite slow. So we need to find ways to uh, bridge that gap in the upper limb. Um, so my go tos at the moment for this area in preparation for return to contact is. Um, if you can, um, you can start doing some degree, depending on your level, you can start doing some degree of plyometric work for the upper limb at home. So um, if you've developed a good press at base and you've been doing press ups for months now, then um, it's time to move on. So plyometric press ups, press ups clap press ups i've started um giving some of the players that i'm working with um a bit of a plyometric press up and then a single arm catch okay so they're catching so they're lifting and maybe they're only uh leaving the ground you know a couple of inches but they're landing on one hand you know uh not completely locking the elbow out but just uh keeping that elbow slightly bent so we can just get that kind of um 
rate of force development and that catch, uh, making sure we train those tendons like uh, we would train them um, in the lower limb as well. So uh, trying to do some work around that and some groundwork as well. So, uh, you know, explosive down ups, um, falling into that press up position, exploding up. Um, and again, trying to do that and having some single arm bias with that as well. Um, so that's what I would start uh, thinking about with regards to um, the upper limb. Uh, so that's rate of force development and just being as fast and powerful as we can with our upper limbs to mimic what's going to happen in the sport. Um, the other thing, and I think this is an area which would potentially be ne neglected by a lot of people, um, apart from maybe front rowers, is the neck, uh, neck training. Um, that really needs to be considered now. So, and that's for all positions in, in a rugby point of view, because everyone's at risk of tackle related neck injuries and tackle related concussions. So anything you can do, start training that neck. And that might be, that might be simple, you know, heavy isometric work with bands, that might be um, if you've got access to a, a neck harness, then you can start doing some um, small weighted work uh, uh, and building that up as, as heavy as you've got access to. Um, and if you've got access to gyms, then great. Then you can use that harness with uh, heavier uh, dumbbell plates and, and cable machines. And if you haven't got access to anything, but, you need to start getting that going. Then you can start doing simple stuff like neck bridges, forward neck bridges, and that might be on your knees to start, just holding, going into a bit of a neck bridge, holding that position, holding your weight in a flex and flex position, and also doing a, a bit of a, a backwards neck bridge where you're trying to take a bit of weight and load through your cervical spine, going up into a gluteal bridge and taking the pressure uh, through the through the head. Um, again, if you're familiar with that, great. If you're not, then just start building that in slowly, okay? Um, people shouldn't be afraid to do that because the net goes through huge forces in rugby games, uh, in, in all positions in the tackle. So um, you're, I think, I personally think you're more at risk down the line by not doing it than by starting those neck, neck exercises now. Um, so, starting to incorporate that as well it's a maybe a an idea of kind of armoring yourself to to that to that contact and especially from an amateur population they're probably listening and thinking oh that's more more that i need to do um but what is the risk of you not doing it you know in terms of well, one, it, it's a significant injury to the neck and also, you know, it's going to be time out of the game, even more time than, than, than what you've been kind of doing. And really kind of the, the last point or the last question is, you know, in terms of from you personally, this could continue. We, we don't know, you know, especially if people keep getting the virus, you know, and we don't become we don't build up the antibodies or become immune to it. What do you see as the future of physiotherapy? Because it is a, by nature, a one-to-one -one or, you know, if you're doing a rehab session in small groups, but definitely one-to-one, -one, you are close to people. You know, I've seen some of the Premier League uh, advice in terms of, you know, protective gear, gowns, very much like a surgeon going in and doing some soft tissue work or, you know, whatever your, your methods are, how, how do you see the, the future of physiotherapy and, you know, is it going to change or how, how do you think? This, this whole, um, this period has highlighted uh, a number of issues and um, it depends on the physio's personal philosophies. Uh, I think during this period where I found, and a lot of physios I spoke to, is that the ability to communicate, educate, 
and coach over online platforms, Zoom platforms, that's, that's been challenged and it's improved over this period. And, um, you know, people have become quite inventive and creative, which should, should give them a bit of a, a legacy going forwards in their own practices, really, of how they can manage people, you know, really remotely. I've been managing people remotely for quite a long time uh, in a second language over, you know, places like Siberia and Krasnyask uh, with players that don't speak English um, via, you know, video platforms, WhatsApp, Google Translate. Um, so people have learned, you know, there's a huge amount you can do um, and there's a huge amount people can improve and get better without necessarily getting huge amounts of uh, hands-on therapy and I think that's where the physiotherapists that have struggled are the ones that have based their entire management plan around hands-on therapy whereas the ones that are that's just a small part and we know that evidence and the science says actually it is the the tissue loading it's the rehabilitation it's the exercise prescription it's the training and the reconditioning that that's the real skill I think that's the real benefits of, of physiotherapy and you can do a huge amount of that online and i think um a lot of players have, have been able to improve their current injuries and improve their physical condition during this period um when we get back the, the, the one thing that's missing i mean the hardest part is the objective and the physical test okay i can get rid of the i can do away with the hands-on and the, the manual therapy, that sort of things at this moment in time, um, because there's other things we can do, but at the hard part is the, the physical, the diagnostics and the, the testing side of things. That's been the hardest part. Um, so yeah, when we resume that side of things, it's gonna be, you know, in full PPE, everything is gonna be very, you know, sterile surgeon type environments. Um, so that, that, that's the main downside I've found. Um, but yeah, being creative and being creative with, with communication, education, coaching and education, you know, and, and reprogramming has been uh, big positives and big benefits. And I think, um, you know, people need to, to reach out to their physiotherapists or, you know, physiotherapists that are out there and strength condition coaches out there because uh, there's huge amounts you can do over line. Uh, online and i think that's um i think so many people have learned so much during this period on the benefits of that and what is possible as opposed to what's uh you know seeing it as a negative uh and a low period of time is i think there's been a huge uh, step forwards i'd like to think there'd be huge step forwards in the professions based so what we can do and hopefully going forwards when all this is over it means that um you know people can still reach out to people all over the world and um get coaching get advice and uh no matter where you are from a person that you know um person's philosophy or system that you uh that you you believe in and want to follow you can do that really easily i i think to to finish up the the two points that i would say is that one that there is access so for example from you know chris's point of view you can go and approach him and say, this is my problem. And via remote online coaching, you know, we can, or Chris can help you to, to, you know, come out of that injury stronger, better, faster, fitter, however you need to be to prepare yourself. And from a, a professional point of view, I think that there's huge access now to CPD, you know, so much, most of it's free as well. People willing to give up their time. Um, and if it's not free, it's, it's very good value because, you know, vast numbers can, can, can join in at once. And, you know, I think that you and I could get bogged down with, with CPD all day, every day, um, because we, we, we don't, we don't have coaching, you know, that, that's, as you rightly say, that's, that's what, that's the love of the, of the game or the profession by that diagnostic, that, knowing those years of experience you know that the kind of plumber scenario who charges you loads and loads of money just to hit one point but he knows the point to hit mm -hmm. um but great you know thanks for taking your time today to to join with us um i'll obviously always as 
you know, link to Chris's um, Instagram and his website. I highly recommend that if you've got that injury and it's niggling away or it, it's not niggling away and it's, it's a big thing that's causing you pain, is to, is to get out there. I think it's very frustrating from our point of view, Chris and I, that people don't invest in, in their future. And even if you're not a professional rugby player, football player, whatever, or, you know, you, you just enjoy playing the game, we want you to enjoy playing the game and, and, and not be broken and, and in lots of pain. So, you know, thanks again for your time, Chris, and we'll look forward to speaking. That's all right. I mean, there's one last thing I was going to say, like, you know, you've got, maybe we've got six to eight weeks, you know, get your coaching sorted, get your injuries sorted, uh, you know, get a program in place, you know, uh, you've got time to have uh, a fantastic season and, and prep for that season when you're going to be back for your teams and you want to come back for your teams, try and be better than uh, your individual, your teammate next year.